Hello and uh, good morning. Um, welcome to the first webinar in the WA100 live series of events. Um, my name is Ben Flatman and I am the architectural editor for um, BD and Building. Um, the subject of today's webinar is how product innovations can support the architecture sector in 2023. Um, there are also a further two sessions following this at 11.30 and 2 p.m. And I will share more details on these at the event at the end of this event. We have several speakers today who uh, approach architecture and product innovation from very different angles. Um, we have Laura from Purcell, um, who comes from a conservation and heritage background. And we also have um, co colleagues from uh, Zaha Deed Architects who are coming from a sort of very cutting edge contemporary architectural approach. And I think it's going to be really interesting today to see how their approaches compare and contrast. So as I said, Laura um, is head of sustainability at Purcell um, and her focus is on sustainability strategy and processes. And then we have Vishu Bhushan and Henry Luth, who are both associates at Zaha Hadid Architects and lead designers in the computation design research group at ZHA. And finally, we will have a presentation from Peter Capelhorn, who is chief executive um, of the Construction Products, Products Association. Peter himself is a chartered architect with more than 38 years of experience. So we're going to have the three presentations and then I will invite questions from the audience um, after the presentations have completed. Um, and the webinar will be available on demand by clicking on the same link you have registered with after the event. And I, I'd just like to ask if you could fill in a short survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. So to, take, to start today's event, I'd like to invite Laura Barron to begin her presentation. I'm hoping that you can see my screen, Ben. Just checking. Yep, I can see your screen. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, brilliant. It's really nice to be here. Thank you, everybody. Um, my name is Laura Barron, as Ben said, and I am head of sustainability at Purcell, who are the world's largest heritage architecture firm specialising in the restoration, conservation and adaptive reuse of the historic built environment. Um, when I was asked to speak on this topic about how innovations can support the architecture sector in 2023, I wanted to first understand what we mean by innovation. Um, and so the basic definition of innovation is using new methods and ideas and the critical word there for me is new and as a starting provocation I wanted to ask is innovation always a good thing is it always to the benefit of society and the planet that we share perhaps another way of thinking about innovation is progress and when we think about progress and we try to visualize progress we might think of this image the ascent of man, this forward and upward motion striding towards his future in a linear way. Now, economist Kate Rayworth equates this image to the pursuit of endless economic growth, that forward and upward trajectory of GDP. Um, and perhaps it isn't a stretch to say that mankind has often mistaken pro profit for progress, and that's often to the detriment of the planet and those that inhabit it. So maybe innovation shouldn't always be about new things, and maybe it isn't about progress, particularly in pursuit of profit. Maybe innovation is just another word for problem solving. And I'd like to think of this as a pro um, this process as circular. So like the rings in a tree, it's not rejecting what's gone before, but more an additional layer, a deeper understanding, and perhaps even a rediscovering of the past. And with any problem solving exercise, you first have to understand the problem and what led to it. Um, we are facing three major crises. So climate breakdown caused by human emitted greenhouse gases, biodiversity loss and social division and inequality. 
And all of these things are interlinked by this drive for progress and endless economic growth. And as professionals working in the built environment sector, any innovation in 2023 needs to be trying to solve these problems because the construction industry is far from faultless, um, contributing 39% of all greenhouse gas emissions and using 50% of all extracted materials. But we can't solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. We need different thinking, but do we necessarily need completely new ideas? We certainly need to move away from our linear economy of take, make and throw away towards a circular economy where materials and assets are kept in use for as long as possible at their highest value. Now in the back built environment, I think that means setting the default as refurbishment of existing buildings rather than demolition, designing out waste, using resources more efficiently and finding the value in what we already have. Now, luckily for us, these practices of repairing, recycling, refurbishing or repurposing, they're all rooted in our past. These are not new ideas. We've all lived in, worked on or visited buildings which have been transformed and adapted for a different use. And this is a fundamental part of what Purcell does and what we have been doing for 75 years. Now, I'm not saying that all our projects have been perfect from an environmental point of view, far from it. But the challenge for us now is how do we adapt and reuse our existing buildings in a way that prolongs their life but in a sustainable and carbon free way and that is the really that's really the innovation that i'm interested in so i'm going to take you through a number of projects briefly and share some of the interesting solutions that we found so 10 years ago we completed the center of refurbishment excellence in stoke-on-trent and our brief was to transform a disused property pottery works into a national center for low energy building retrofit including a conference venue, exhibition zone for innovative products and a construction training college. Repairs were like for like and new interventions designed to be reversible. And the project tested a number of different um, technologies and the use of internal, external and cavity wall insulation. It achieved high air tightness performance, particularly for this typology. Photovoltaic panels, solar hot water panels, ground source heat pumps, a biomass boiler, rainwater harvesting, these were all integrated. And the plant room forms a really crucial part of the building circulation so people can understand how the building works, coupled with display screens in the common parts, providing updates on energy use data. So whilst 10 years ago, this project seemed quite ahead of its time, um, and many of the technologies have, have since advanced, so some becoming more efficient and affordable, the general approach to retrofit hasn't changed that much. It's about reducing energy demand, both through how the building is used and improving building fabric and complementing these with low energy technologies and renewable systems. We took a similar approach at Hollyhead, where this derelict market hall located in the heart of the town and really rooted in community life was restored and transformed into a new community centre. We utilised an the existing structure strengthened the roof supports to take the additional weight of insulation and solar panels. We incorporated automatically opening windows on sensors and new natural ventilator chimneys, meaning the building can be passively ventilated throughout the year. Um, walls are lined with wood wool insulation and finished with hemp lined plaster internally. And both of these are natural materials that are breathable, allowing the existing masonry wall to regulate moisture. And it's these types of products that I think are really interesting. Those naturally derived materials with low or negative embodied carbon. They've been around for centuries, but are being used and applied in innovative ways, either to retrofit our existing buildings or in contemporary new buildings. Hemp, for example, is a material we use quite regularly in relation to insulation, but we're also looking at using it in other forms, such as hempcrete, which is fire resistant, it's got great insulating properties and thermal mass. This image on the right shows the preparation and layering of different natural materials needed to improve the thermal performance of an old masonry wall. Um, it's, it's a technical solution, but done in with natural materials and in traditional ways. This project in Oxford combines natural materials like timber and thatch using local craftsmanship and skills and complementing these with contemporary detailing um, to create a visitor centre and education space. And this, in my view, demonstrates how historic methods of construction can still have relevance in the 21st century. Um, another way innovation is helping the heritage sector specifically is windows. Um, we recently installed the first double closed windows in a grade one listed building in England. And whilst this may not seem that innovative to some, traditionally in England, double glazing has been heavily resisted in listed buildings because it's felt windows are an integral part to a building's character. 
Um, but through close consultation with Historic England, we've been able to install these slimline double glazed units, achieving new values of 1.9 and a thickness of 16 millimetres, whilst ensuring the building's heritage value is secured. And similarly, we're seeing the uptake of vacuum glazing systems like Finio that achieve the same new values as triple glazing um, through even slimmer profiles of just seven millimetres thick, really pushing the boundaries of performance in the heritage settings. Other innovations we're seeing influence the heritage sector are renewable energy technologies. So here at Software Cathedral, we're looking at photovoltaics designed to replicate the existing slate tiles. We're also developing a ground source heat strategy that utilizes the fact the cathedral sits on an aquifer. Um, in Newcastle Cathedral, this was the first grade one listed building to install heat pump technology combined with an efficient underfloor heating system. This work involved lifting over a hundred ancient stone ledges, which were carefully restored and then relayed. Um, and then finally, I want to finish on this project in Hong Kong, um, the Taekwon Center for Heritage and Arts. And this, this project saw the adaptive reuse of 16 historic buildings to provide this rare courtyard oasis in the middle of one of the densest cities in the world. The project was a collaboration with Herzog and de Meuron, who designed the new build elements and the facade of which was clad with recycled aluminium bricks from old alloy wheels. But the restoration of the existing building involved the meticulous salvaging of floors, finishes, ironmongery, doors, windows, granite, blocks, which were reused as paving, bricks, which were, if they were damaged, they were individually taken out, turned around and replaced to restore the original finish without using new materials. And whilst these painstaking techniques to salvage existing historic fabric for reuse is commonplace in the heritage sector, seeing existing buildings as a valuable bank of materials is unfortunately not mainstream. For example, in the UK, around 50,000 buildings are demolished each year, contributing to 62% of the country's total waste production. There are, however, a handful of pioneering organisations that are really trying to address this issue um, to make it easier to carefully dismantle, store, process and redistribute materials within the supply chain. So I've got a number of their names up on the screen if, if people are interested in looking more at those. Um, and seeing all materials as material, um, seeing all buildings as material banks that have value is really the kind of innovation that I think is, is quite exciting. So this final slide going back to the Taekwon Center nestled in amongst the towering sea of new buildings in Hong Kong sums up what I'd like to end on, which is innovation is certainly part of the solution to our current crisis. And there are some really exciting advancements being made in this space, but let's avoid innovation for innovation's sake. Um, instead of valuing something just because it's new, let's start by valuing what we have and finding ways to make it the best it can be. And perhaps the best innovation in 2023 will be architects who see their role more as custodians rather than creators. Thank you. Thanks very much, Laura. Um, really interesting uh, presentation and uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions there. I think uh, the whole concept of what innovation is for, you know, and um, whether it's for its own sake or not um, is one that I'm sure we'll be picking up on later. Um, Vishu and Henry, would you like to proceed with your presentation, please? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we are just waiting for the video to come up. Yeah. Uh, many thanks, first of all, for the invite. Uh, uh, happy to be here and presenting with uh, <clears throat> my colleague Henry. Uh, we are part of the computation and design group at Zahadi Architects. Uh, which was co-founded in 2007 by Shajay Bhushan, Nils Fisher, and Patrick Schumacher. Uh, as it is a practice embedded uh, research group, initially we were kind of doing a lot of uh, project independent research and uh, not tying back in. But since 2016 or 2014, when we started uh, working on the mathematics gallery at the Science Museum in London, uh, we brought our experimental aspects into delivering projects. And since then, the team has grown to about 20 people now and we are contributing on wide scale projects, including stadiums, master plans, uh, configurators, uh, metaverse related gaming, etc. And you can clearly see uh, the evolution of uh, scale uh, since the 2007 when we are doing like small scale chairs, etc. Uh, our research is focused on uh, these four aspects uh, on uh, project independent research, developing toolkits which applied on large scale projects, uh, testing these pro uh, toolkits on sp special interest or pilot projects initially. And once they mature, they get applied onto commercial projects. And 
uh, all of this follow a guiding principle of any research or innovation, which is to learn from history and try to seek principally correct things. Uh, it seeks to develop tools to augment the intelligence of the designer and not to replace them. So it's enabling more a human and computer interaction at early stages of design. Uh, uh, this is combined with a spatial technology stack, uh, which kind of spans uh, content creation, which is used for early stages of design, and also for content delivery, uh, which is kind of used for later stages uh, to deliver a project. Uh, these include things like uh, robotic manufacturing, cost estimation, uh, modular and prefabricated uh, construction, game technologies, etc. And these are some of the varied scale of projects we have been able to apply the technology onto, uh, such as uh, which are going in, being in construction or almost uh, being ending completion, uh, being like the Xi'an Stadium on the top left or the Unicorn Towers on the top right, uh, some of the master plans, the Mbia master plan at the bottom right is also being built. Uh, in 2023, uh, our innovations kind of focus on these four categories, uh, looking at high performance geometry, uh, participatory game technologies, metaverse and cyber physical spaces, machine learning and AI. Uh, today, we'll kind of focus a bit on the first two, uh, looking at which draws a lot from the gaming and the computer graphics industries. One of the projects we'll present uh, uh, at, as part of the high performance geometry is the Striatis, which was a collaboration with uh, Block Research Group at ETH Zurich, uh, our team at Zahadid Architects, uh, Incremental 3D, and uh, it was made possible by Holsen. Uh, Striatis was a, a 3D concrete printed bridge, a masonry bridge, uh, which was looking at high performance shape, uh, ba basically looking at low energy, low carbon, very lightweight, high span. Uh, Make kind of geometries similar to an eggshell. You can see it that it performs very well under compression, uh, but if you give it uh, lateral forces, it might it, it might crack like an eggshell. And we were trying to use this principle, uh, marrying that uh, with historical um, masonry uh, and wisdom, which was uh, which are evident in the bridges of Venice. Uh, looking at like gothic walls, etc., and trying to replace the stone with you know, something uh, with the synthetic stone, what we call a synthetic stone in this case, 3D printed concrete blocks. Uh, this and this was possible uh, to bring forward a new language for concrete, where we were using established and en enduring uh, material uh, combined with the ancient wisdom of masonry but bringing it into the contemporary setting of robotic and digital manufacturing techniques. Um, video playing. Uh, another goal of the project was to do sustainable, sustainable digital concrete. What we mean by that is to use reduce the use of material required. So print the material only where structurally required. Uh, try to have uh, material uh, separation such that it can be reused and recycle the material. So this was done for the Venice Biennale in 2021. And the same material is currently being used again for its final installation at New York and uh, the wholesale headquarters. Uh, this is a small video showcasing uh, what the project was. Uh, it was uh, three to six months of uh, three, uh, sorry six months of uh, collaboration between ETH, Zaha, and uh, Incremental 3D and Holson. And you can see all the different materials which went into it. Uh, these are kind of the guiding principles of how each layer of the print layer is kind of aligned to the structural forces, such that they are perpendicular, similar, similar to an action. Each of the blocks were pre-fabricated and uh, sent to site, and they were dry joint in this case a neoprene sheet kind of holds them together all of this was made possible because of an integrated design to production pipeline uh, which en encompasses the early stage design which uh, the early stage form finding uh, stereotomy of the blocks uh, into 50 blocks in this case and then doing some structural tests to see that this actually stands in pure friction 
and then building up an innovation of uh, how uh, science distance fields to generate the print paths uh, such that it can be one continuous print path which is perpendicular to the forces and then sending the required G code to the robot to print. Each of these 53 blocks were printed in about uh, 80 hours. And then uh, in this case, uh, there was a scaffold required, uh, but subsequent research has been developed to uh, reduce that. So, hi, my name is Henry Luth. I co-lead the day-to-day -day of the computation group with Vishu. I'm a registered architect in the US and a lead accredited professional. I lead the game technology and digital timber research within the group. I'll share with you today uh, a bit of the digital architectural platform we've developed with AKT, AKT2 and Hilson Moran to create homes for Route 10 Prospera. The residential designs are a specified ecological and social response to the climate, terrain, and culture of Rotan in the Caribbean. The desire to bring high value housing to market quickly has led us to explore alternative and even disruptive forms of procurement using game technology. Conventional procurement in real estate is linear, time consuming, and game technology can be parallel and real time. The platform offers clients a universe of feasible variations at their fingertips. For instance, there are at least 1,500 ways to choose the type and position of a residence within the 5x5 grid of Honduras. Designed through a digital kit of parts, this modular approach anticipates a shift towards design for manufacture, leveraging digital manufacturing data to provide users with a world of feasible manufacturable solutions. This is made possible by inheriting a computationally lightweight, discretized geospatial system comprised of voxels. Each voxel is appended with attributes to instantiate in a corresponding unit, its envelope, and add-ons for a given configuration. The Bayabu Residential Configurator is the latest build in a lineage of residential platforms we've been developing at Zaha with Epic in Unreal Engine, offering investors, occupiers, developers ways to configure properties to suit. Offering the ability to position residential building units with um, while assessing variations. Features such as air and development rights have been monetized in the process to configure modular building components in real time using a web-based application. Platform design and architecture, engineering, and construction helps to test fit, simulate, and explore scenarios to design market-tested, demand-driven solutions. This ensures relevant content is available to trending markets throughout the procurement process, a form of agile manufacture. Likewise, the configurator can be used socially to curate a community, to accommodate the peculiar spatial needs of family members, invite friends, and connect to like-minded individuals. The research explores the domain of sustainable lightweight timber and engineered timber products for the use in digitized construction and manufacturing. Local source timber and modular thinking contribute to solutions which minimize the embedded construction energy and carbon footprint of the schemes. A reduction in waste material and higher quality of construction are achieved due to the precision of off-site manufacture. Schemes rely on a just-in-time concept that the factory will coordinate the delivery in the kit of parts quickly assembled on site. The platform offers local construction companies and building tradespersons and other crafts the benefit from the infusion of digital technologies into the economy. Circular Factory, a company focused on robotic fabrication of engineered timber products, has constructed a micro factory on island and set up the necessary logistics chain to infuse this technology in the local economy. Bayabu creates a digital marketplace integrated to supply chain, aligned to industry partners, their building products, processes, and technologies. The supply chain streams are understood through the time component of different assembly complexities and component interface planning from near site to uh, dry assembly for intelligent prefabricated components. Shifting design thinking to game technologies and platform development at Zaha Hadid Architects has empowered our capacity to disrupt conventional procurement process and bring together stakeholders in locally relevant resource effective supply chain integrated design solutions. So we leave you with um, a video here that is some of our ongoing work in the metaverse. And um, I hope that um, you enjoyed our presentation. Thanks. Thanks very much, Henry and Rishi. Um, very interesting. Um, so we're going to move on now 
to our final presentation. And um, Peter, if you'd like to take over. Um, ben, thank you very much indeed. Fascinating, fascinating presentations there. I wanted to just uh, de develop a few more of the day-to-day -day thoughts on innovation um, for, for this morning's session. Um, and, and firstly, um, harping back to some of the things we, we've heard there. Um, so what is innovation? Uh, do we know it when we see it? Um, do we take advantage of it? Um, where's, the, where's the future of innovation going uh, uh, for designers and for the rest of the industry? I often think that um, one person's uh, innovation um, is potentially something that just goes by the by uh, for others. Uh, and in fact, in construction, if we look at uh, history going back maybe 10, 20 years, if you look at any particular part of uh, a, a product, such as a brick, window, walls, roofs, um, if, you take, if you take your mind back 10 or 20 years, um, broadly, we've got the same sort of components, obviously, apart from uh, what uh, we, we've just seen, which is, which is very much um, cutting edge. But we, we look at those products and we think, well, have they really changed? Um, and actually, when you start to anal analyze it, yes, they have. It's amazing how many things um, are going on in the background. So take, for instance, uh, a brick these days, produced in entirely different uh, methodologies, although obviously the principles go back hundreds of years. We are looking this year to see the first um, uh, brickworks uh, totally uh, um, provided power from sustainable sources, for instance, in the UK. That's a, that's a world first. Um, we, we see lots of different techniques being developed in the background taking those basic products that designers use all the time and developing them. So you can say maybe that is, uh, maybe that's just progress, maybe that's actually um, just what we expect as, as a society, harping back to some of the Laura's, Laura's points there. But you can also see that, that clearly there is innovation locked into some of, the, some of those key points. Um, and I, I think that that's what we, we tend to look for uh, across, the, across the industry. We don't want the same things delivered in the same way. We have, we have a lot of external pressures these days as well. And that drives innovation, in my view. So we have a need, of course, to reduce carbon and energy, both in production of products, but also in, in the, their use. Uh, and I think we are, we are gradually getting to terms with the fact that it's a whole carbon uh, principle that we should be looking at as designers. The key thing for me is to make sure that we use those resources that we bring into construction use those resources as best we possibly can. Are we going to get the longest life out of those materials and the energy that we have put in? And sometimes that's a tricky balance. And, and I think a lot of the industry is trying to come to terms with those difficulties in terms of establishing exactly how much energy and resource do you put into something? How much life are you gonna get out of it in, it, in its primary use, but also building in the philosophy of recycle, reuse, circular economy. Those, those kind of thing, principles and thinking are very much current, certainly within the construction manufacturing industries going forward. Now, I mentioned external pressures, and, and we can see today, of course, that there is a, a lot of pressure, certainly on the environmental side of things, but also on performance, particularly fire. We all, we all are working towards a, a different industry following the Grenfell disaster. And so a focus on fire performance of products is key. That is driving a significant amount of innovation, not just in the actual products themselves, but how they're produced and how they're tested and how they are analyzed in those kind of limit critical situations. So, we need to we need to have an understanding that pro procurement and innovation are linked energy resources are linked there are there are lots of 
interconnected, complicated issues here. And when we see, going back to our simple products, when we see those, those on site, a lot of work has gone into making sure that that product is as good as it possibly can be. And along the way, attracting a whole load of incremental steps of innovation. These days, we have processes that will uh, take the product through the factory in a much more uh, efficient, but also uh, a much better quality controlled process. It will deliver that product to site in the most efficient form. Uh, and again, a lot of emphasis is now on how we innovate with transport, making sure that products uh, come from the factory to the site, um, particularly making sure that they're not damaged so we don't have to waste uh, products and throw them away. We also make sure that the, uh, the uh, protection that is used on products is, is as limited as possible, but nonetheless de delivers an efficient job. And again, that needs to be recycled and used again. When we look at how all these processes come together, we can see products that actually uh, provide better performance. We can see products that actually come together uh, in, in a much more um, efficient manner. Designs these days use many more materials in conjunction with each other. And, and again, a, a fundamental principle in making sure that they all come together properly on site. We have an industry where uh, we have a skills shortage, so making sure that those products can go together with the limited skills that are available on site and in, in a one-time efficient process. All of that is about innovation in the background, making sure that those products will work and perform throughout their life and continue to perform at that high level until the end of their primary life. But of course, then we say, OK, and let's look at how those products then can turn into something else, can be recycled uh, and drive that part of, of the, the construction industry. And again, many of those points were mentioned um, previously by Laura. I think it's important that we, we recognize as an industry that the innovation that potentially we don't see is there in the background all the time producing a fundamental push towards a better industry, a better industry in terms of the products that we can use to design with, but also better performance for the, for the, the people who will use those buildings, who will, um, if you like, benefit from all of those little bits of innovation that have led us to those conclusions, those answers, and eventually those, those built conclusions. So, what will we what will we see in the near future? I think that there, as I said, there's a lot of energy, a lot of work going on across the uh, the product production arena. I think we will we will see more intense R and D, and we've just seen a couple of really good examples of that. More use of computer power to identify how those processes can be properly used and how they can go forward. Less energy, less resources being put into products. There's a great deal of work going on in terms of making sure that primary energy and things like water are carefully managed, carefully used in the production of products. I think we will see longer life and more straightforward assembly processes, and that is crucial in terms of making sure that the industry is as, is as uh, efficient and, <clears throat> excuse me, and as productive as possible. And remember that that's a crucial element, <clears throat> excuse me. And then bringing that all together, making sure that the digital information that drives the product in the first place is then on record so that we can make sure that we understand how those products were produced in the first place. And then when we get further into maintenance and end of life, we can identify exactly what to do with those products to best effect. So I think that there's a, there's a number of key trends there that are coming together in, in our um, industry just at the moment. And I think everybody will benefit from them. It's important for designers, I think, to understand some of those processes and, and to be able to use those in their designs going forward. And that's not just the high end big projects. That's the stuff of everyday 
design and architecture. And I think there's there's some wonderful things just on the cusp coming forward that we can all use uh, and, and take forward in our in our daily daily business. So if I come to a conclusion now, I think it's important to to recognise even the most humble product is actually a, a a combination of a huge amount of innovation just to get it to that position that you see and that you use in your design. And so just, I think, think about and reflect on all the care and expertise that's been put together. It might not be obvious, but it is there lurking beneath the, beneath the surface. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Peter. It's brilliant. Um, so I'm gonna open up to questions now. We've already had a, a couple come through. Um, Laura, I think this was a question for you that came through near the start from Alan Hunt. And um, he was saying that uh, as a sustainability consultancy, we use VR, AR within our own metaverse space to check designs for sustainable builds. Um, but he says we find um, the architects working in, I, th I think this is what he means, in conservation and heritage uh, are not tending to use Revit or AutoCAD 3D models. Um, that, I don't, that might not apply to Purcell, but I'm just wondering if you had a comment on that. Is there a sort of, is there perhaps an issue with um, heritage and consultancy sector architects not embracing innovative technology in the way that, at the rate they should be? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, we, we do use Revit, we use BIM, we have BIM on a lot of big heritage projects. We're using it at um, Manchester Town Hall at the moment and on the House of Parliament where we're working. Um, so it is something that we are um, embracing and utilising and see the benefits of. I think um, there's lots of useful um, things that it can bring to a project in terms of the speed at which you can collect data, the way that you can analyse and explain projects, particularly in very complex um, very complex um, heritage buildings, which often are a collection of lots of different ages of buildings and different geometries. So we can definitely see the benefits. Some of the challenges are, of course, that you they, they, there's an expectation of um, accuracy that isn't necessarily always possible when you're working with existing buildings because you have that quite a, an extensive discovery phase of what you're trying to um, when you're trying learning about the building and what it's how it's constructed and what it's made out of so that that sometimes can be a bit of a um a barrier but yeah it's certainly something that we're seeing used a lot more and actually the project that we um i showed in newcastle cathedral and Salford cathedral we used um vr to kind of help help the clients and stakeholders visualize what that what that space is going to be like so um brilliant thanks laura um I'd like to sort of just build on that question with Vishu and Henry. Um, I think sort of obviously no question of you guys not adopting the latest um, technology in terms of CAD and Revit. Is there a way in which you're finding it helps you um, both explore the potential of new products, but also demonstrate their capabilities or test their capabilities? Yep, so I can, I can pick this one up, Vichu. So I think like to pick up on something that Peter mentioned, like how do we get the longest life out of, you know, in, in the particular thing that he mentioned was materials. And I would say that we think about that in a few other realms, that what is the longest life that we can get out of our real estate portfolio? What is the longest life that we can get out of our cities? And we're taking on these two sort of ways of thinking about the problem. So when we think about like um, existing building stock, if we look at like office decline or city decline and it's sort of uh, post COVID loss of inner city, you know, like uh, working space, there's sort of a demand for thinking about how we make use of our cities and what, what are the uses that are amenable or compatible to that city usage and the longevity of it, right? This is ultimately the sustainability of our cities and down one level of sort of hierarchy, the individual buildings that comprise that. So one of the things that we're also looking at is the use of game tech, not necessarily for the data side, but just to be able to vet out, you know, are, are there compatible office to resi, micro resi uses or interjecting additional like social community amenities, like, 
you know, com communal libraries or food court type things that start to interject mixed use suggestions within the existing building stock that might have all only been sort of very homogenous. And and so this thinking about the city as a as a collective and ultimately thinking about our building stock that um, as cities grow and swell and decline, we think about it collectively. That's also a useful way to examine how you can make use of these technologies is that, you know, with, with so much, um, with so many variables at play, it's um, at least in this in this side with the game technologies, it's very, very quick to sort of vet out uh, different scenarios for how a community might be. And we're working with Epic on, on something at the moment that sort of looks at this more specifically in city environments um, and, and more of these sort of crossovers of uh, amenable or compatible functions, but also retrofitting things to be of a different sort of function group. So for instance, from office to resi is slightly different than office to uh, another compatible use. Um, I hope that answers your question. It's slightly more broad broad thinking about the application of, of the technology and how it can be used um, in, yeah, in broader really strokes. Peter, is, is the sort of metaverse sort of uh, figuring in, in your work? Um, well, I have to say not quite yet, um, but if you like, um, I'd like to, to, to take it from exactly the opposite end to, to Henry. Instead of going big, I'd like to go very small. Um, and, and because for me, um, the, the products and materials are the DNA of, uh, of the built environment. Uh, and so what we're looking at there is a revolution in terms of making sure that every product is digitally identifiable, has its own, has its own unique identifier, and uh, the, the product data is, is fully digitalized across a universal platform. And we've been working on this for a few few years now. Obviously, it's not something that that is um, easy or quick. But the, the the goal there is to make sure that whatever the material, whatever the product, uh, any designer, any specifier, can use the same digital platform, the same principles to to pull those together into a specification, or in or indeed um, put it into any sort of BIM model or any uh, any uh, model at all. And in that way, you can verify precisely and very quickly the performance, uh, the, the ultimate characteristics, sizes, weights, densities, all that stuff. Um, that's just around the corner. And, and I think that will then feed into uh, all of the all of the things we've been talking about this morning. Above all, for me, it's to make sure that we actually are very clear about what, what we're using in terms of design, what resources that's taking up, but also we can be very clear what we've actually constructed. Unfortunately, many of the buildings that we've had in recent years across the wider environment, when you look at the completed building, nobody can tell you precisely what products and materials have gone into it. And I think that's one of the things that we've got to use innovation, use technology to reverse. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I had a quick question and um... I used to work for a practice called Ian Ritchie Architects. He did a lot of work with um, Pilkington Glass um, on sort of new product innovation and development. Um, I'm just, what I'd like to speak, I'd just like, like to ask Laura uh, and then um, the rest of you as well, um, what your experience is of working with product manufacturers on developing new products. Um, so rather than sort of, I suppose, waiting for sort of things to come to market, are you sort of, actively collaborating with manufacturers and suppliers um, and is that an area of work that architects should be more proactively pursuing? Yeah it's a really good question. Um, I think uh, we, uh, given that we work in heritage primarily that we work a lot with craftspeople and people that are um, kind of masters of the, the materials that they use and so we do work directly with the end manufacturers in that sense and work with them about how best to realize the designs that we've got and make sure that it works within the heritage setting so in that sense i think yes we do but perhaps not in the same way that um you're you're perhaps asking um i think in terms of of new products i think that what Peter, just to pick up on what Peter was saying, I think the use of the kind of introduction of material passports will be quite 
um, important and trying to we're, we're talking a lot to manufacturers and asking them for um, their uh, environmental performance declarations and making sure that they have got those um, environmental credentials that, that that's something that they're thinking about and that's something that they're providing because that helps informs our it informs our decision making and i think the other thing that we we tend to do is we've got a list of questions that we go out and ask to ask suppliers about their supply chains and the materials and the energy that they use and and that so that we've got we've got a good understanding before we specify something and i think the more pressure we can put on um product manufacturers um, about those kind of environmental and social credentials I think the more that we can kind of try and shift the market in the, in the way that it needs to be going in. Vishu and Henry do you have experience of working with um, product manufacturers or suppliers on sort of developing new innovative? <laughs> yeah yeah it's like a very good question and that's also one of the mandates within the group for us is to kind of collaborate with industry partners and develop products and technology with them and also to showcase how that can be used like doing like these kind of technology demonstrators is uh, like very much a way of research and innovation for us so we always keep collaborating with like ai build or incremental 3d or looking at digital timber now uh, like we are always on the lookout for uh, collaborative aspects with the technology and with product uh, manufacturing teams so as that it can we can know what the product is but also integrate it into our design pipelines which is very much important right because you need to develop a tectonic for the given product or a given manufacturing process and that is one of the mandate within the group to kind of develop that know-how but also showcase how that can be applied in early stages of design it's not coming at later stages where you're rationalizing geometries to fit to a product but you already know what the product is and designing according and developing a design language for that. And yeah, so far, like, uh, yeah, it has been quite successful for us since initially it was uh, kind of doing small scale products uh, like furniture, but that has now grown into almost like building scale uh, things now. And then hopefully now uh, next step would be for a wider mass scale application of them. Thanks. Peter, is there anything you'd like to add on that about sort of collaboration between architects and product manufacturers? Absolutely, Ben. I, I, I think it's it really good that, that architects and designers do collaborate with manufacturers. And, and in the past, in my past life, uh, I've done a lot of um, work with directly with manufacturers. Uh, as, as you said, just go uh, it, to a manufacturer early days uh, and, and ask them what they are capable of doing and start that conversation. One thing I, I did want to mention though, I do feel these days um, we don't get enough designers visiting factories, visiting uh, the, the, the sort of place where, where manufacturing yeah, is, is cited. Um, getting that experience of how products are made firsthand, I think is, is really helpful. I'd recommend anybody um, taking up a factory visit wherever it, it, it may be and sometimes it turns into a nice trip actually but the, the important thing there is to see how the products are actually made in the first place and that insight is fabulous when you're trying to design um, and equally taking that experience onto site and seeing how it's actually assembled seeing how it, it, it gets embedded into the final uh, construction is also great experience and, and I'd encourage everybody uh, to, uh, to to get um, their fair share of that. Thanks Peter. Um, I've got a question here from uh, one of the one of the, the listeners. Um, Rabrina Nikolova has asked and this is a question for Laura but I think it'd be interesting to sort of share it around. Um, have you done any calculations around the percentage of reused materials that you've in, you have integrated into your design? That's a really good question. Um, it's some, so we we are do, we're doing a lot of retrospective work at looking at our projects, um, particularly in terms of the materials that we've used and in the carbon the whole life cycle. So we've re revisited a number of completed projects that were finished in the last. Um, five years to understand what their whole life carbon was what materials were specified and obviously the numbers that we get are kind of as with all life cycle assessments they are um 
a good a good estimation of where we can get what we can get um what the numbers are but i think um there's still a long way to go when we're looking at life cycle assessments in terms of the accuracy and so it's really informing it's helping to inform our decision making looking at previous projects and i think um the the carbon assessments that we've done where we've compared very similar projects where we've looked at um reusing existing buildings versus a new building that are similar use and sim similar kind of size do very much lean towards um reuse as a sol solution that re reduces carbon and so that's kind of that's definitely informing a lot of our decision making now and re particularly reusing structures um which is obviously something that we do a lot of but we do we have been doing um, more and more new builds as well so it's kind of taking those things into account and then also looking at the materials that we've specified in the past and understanding um what was good about them and what what um and particularly what whether or not they were sequestering carbon um is something that makes quite a big difference to us so yeah we're we're learning things that we've we've um we've worked on in the past and trying to feed that into the decisions that we're doing um in future Brilliant. projects Vishu and Henry, I was just wondering um, to what extent sort of material reuse um, features in your practices work or thinking, and if it does, you know, what role AI gaming sort of cutting edge um, technology can play in facilitating that approach? Yeah, it's an interesting domain and uh, we have also been looking into it. Uh, the Striatus bridge I kind of showcased uh, has this reuse, uh, like the, the blocks are going to be, the, the material used for the blocks are going to be reused in another installation. Uh, uh, and also it also kind of encourages to have clear separation of materials. So in this case, if it is concrete and steel, uh, so that they can be separated very easily and then recycled to use. And that is kind of uh, where it's very, it's very much important to have this material separation and like AI and this like it's data is kind of used in understanding uh, what are the shapes of the block uh, so you can do a scan of the geometry and get it back and see analyze uh, what is the strength of it and uh, can that be reused somewhere else so these are kind of avenues where AI and data can help us uh, understand the material a bit better and then evaluate if that could be reused uh, as the same component or can it be crushed and reuse the material or uh, for use case could be some instead of being a slab can it be something else so these are kind of avenues we are currently looking into brilliant well, i think go, I, just to add to that it, it goes slightly beyond just the reuse of the materials in in our case like thinking about the life cycle of the concrete goes to we're using significantly less of it and the positioning of that concrete is very specific such that it does not need rebar right so like the reuse is actually in the, in the sort of negation of some systems because of the efficiency of the structural form and i think that we would sort of to pick up on you know the um, laura mentioned you know the use of hemp for interiors i, I think we would ask the question could we make a bridge out of hemp you know, like, could it structurally hold something up? And these are the types of questions that we would ask. I mean, in fact, there are spatial structures that have been made out of mushrooms and and they hold themselves up. So um, that's not to say they would perform, but those thought processes are types of things that add to how we think about using computation as a test bed for simulating an approximation of what the shape would be such that it is of a shape that would allow us to use significantly less material. And so the reuse factor is is then not necessarily in a specific product specification that has a percentage of reuse or in the existing building, we make sure we have the 80% or so to check off a certain criteria, but rather that as an ethos, we approach it as how can we build better with less and how can computation assist us in that you know facility? And that's always been a guiding factor of the group. And um, I think it, it sort of goes hand in hand with the discussion about material thinking. And, and Vishu also touched on, um, just to close with this, that um, it's not often about the material itself. It's about trying to figure out the process that empowers that material to actually be. So in, in the instance of striatus with the, with the, the sort of ink-like concrete, 
you know, there's there are a number of innovations that need to be worked out in the pipeline. And Peter, you sort of spoke to this on the supply chain integration side that it's not just on the design, the onus isn't on just the design professional to work these problems out. To get sort of true innovation really requires people on the front end and people on the delivery end working together to sort of bring this to mainstream industry. Otherwise, it's sort of just a um, a novelty, right? And so getting things to mainstream requires a significant effort on the materials and the specification side and we're, we're sort of working with our partners to make sure that happens. I think, can I just come in for one second? The, I think the one thing that I'd add on that as well is that one of the things, because you know we're in a climate emergency and it, it feels quite often that we're not really treating it like an emergency. And, and one of the questions that we should be asking ourselves as architects, which is something that is definitely not something that you're taught in, I wasn't taught in university, is do we need a building at all? And you know, do we actually need to have more stuff and perhaps the answer is just let's do less and it's not it's not you know how do, how do we get this with less materials but let's just do do we need it just in the first place i think is a really hard thing to um come to terms with as an architect but it's something that we should be starting as a starting point should be asking ourselves thanks laura um really good good point there um peter I, I'd like feel free to, to sort of add to that, but I just I had a quick we almost run out, run out of time. Um, I just had a, one more question um, that I'd like to ask, and that was um, it's a sort of I think it's a sort of almost a sort of um, well, can um, the certification authorities be doing more to help um, innovation? And is there I suppose add on point to that um, so that was a question from um, one of the the listeners um but also is is the, is so it, the question was from shamila Yusuf, and it was how can third party certification bodies support architectural innovation especially with regards to net carbon retrofit and sustainability i, I just wanted to add to that it is the the new sort of certification body environment within the uk following brexit providing opportunities for innovate innovation or is it a block or is it just adding sort of complications that we didn't need so ben if i can just yeah so uh, um that that's whole other seminar actually just in those <laughs> in those two two words there but if i can sum it up very quickly it's yeah. complicated and at the moment it's in chaos um right. we have we we have gone from uh, a, a European arena of 770 testing and certification bodies down to less than 40. Uh, and those 40 don't cover all the products that we need to cover in the UK. So at the moment, that, that's a really difficult and complicated area. Putting an optimistic view on this, uh, I think longer term, we are working towards a much better joined up industry because of all the turmoil, if you like. Um, and so I can I can see a position where actually uh, it's certainly got harping back to joined up digital thinking and joined up digital information, uh, a, a common database that will lead us to uh, the ability of third party testing being much more focused on what we need as designers, but also focused on helping to create innovation. And if I just harp back slightly to the previous uh, points that we were discussing, um, implicit in that is reducing waste. Um, and at the moment, we've got to remember that in, in conventional construction, we waste many tons of materials for every single house built. Now that's got to be something that the industry needs to address and certainly designers should be thinking about that. But of course, manufacturers need to lend a hand as well. And I would like to see much more joined up thinking, certainly when we are producing lots of those things, as Laura says, do we really need them? Well, we, we do need loads of houses. I think that that's true, but it's how we design and, and actually procure them. And, and final thought from me, I don't think industrialization is going to answer that question. Um, and we could possibly spend another morning just talking about that as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Um, but uh, yes, thank you so much for, for the contributions. It's been fascinating. Um, for our listeners, um, I believe that the recording of this will be available um, after the session closes.
by re-clicking the link. Um, and just a reminder that we have two further sessions today. So at 11.30 a.m. we've got Architectural Innovation, the technology helping architects to design for the future. And at 2 p.m. we have Developing Across Borders, Delivering the Built Environment in a Globalised World. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I look forward to uh, speaking to you uh, again soon. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice meeting you, Laura and Peter. Bye-bye.